Amen. Good morning, church family. It is good to see you this morning. Uh, a couple things before we get started. One, I want to thank all of you uh, for just being who you are, for being willing to do some of the things that we've had to do over the last 16 months, uh, especially just even as we've had to track backwards. Uh, I know it's not fun wearing masks, trust me, as a big-nosed person. Uh, it's just not enjoyable, but I want to say thank you because it's something small, that makes a big difference in what we do. And look, church family, I want to share with you, I've spent more time in the last two and a half and three weeks praying with, crying with, consoling other pastors that I am friends with because of outbreaks and people that they have lost in their churches than I ever wanted to spend in my ministry career. And so I realize it's something that's not fun, but it is something very small that makes a big difference. And so I just want to say thank you. I also want to ask you to do something because we are not just our church. But we are part of the larger church here in Starville. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12 when he talks about the church being the body of Christ. He says that when one part of the body rejoices, all of the body rejoices. When one part of the body hurts, all of the body hurts. When one part of the body grieves, all of the body grieves. And church family, there are some parts of our body here in Starville that are hurting and grieving right now. Uh, last week, if you tuned in or if you were with us online... You joined with us in praying for Medivue Baptist Church and some of our brothers there. Uh, church family, our, our brothers and sisters at Medivue are hurting. They've lost two key leaders and deacons in the last seven days. They have several others who are sick. Another personal friend of mine who's there that's in ICU right now, still ventilated. And so several of us in town as pastors got together on Friday. And here's what we talked about. We talked about what would it mean for our brothers and sisters at Medivue if this morning, all across our area, as many of us as would, would just write notes of encouragement to them. To just say, hey, we love you, we are with you, we are praying for you. And then this week, if church by church, we just began delivering dozens and dozens of notes to our sister church, letting them know that they are on our minds and on our hearts. So outside of this room, when you leave out from the service, you're going to see a round table that's going to have a whole bunch of blank notes. They'll have Starville Community Church on the top of them and pens set out. And I'm going to ask you to just write a note of encouragement to Medivue Baptist Church and just tell them that you love them. Tell them that you're praying for them. Tell them that you're there. And then this week we're going to deliver those. And I think we might be surprised how much that does for our brothers and sisters in Christ. All right. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to open up your Bibles. Now we kind of got that out of the way to the book of Habakkuk. If you're not sure where that is, it's entirely understandable. All right, open up your index. This will be a good kind of process. All right, and look it up. If you've got your phone, then you'll be able to cheat and just scroll right to it. Uh, but I want you to open up to the book of Habakkuk. What we're going to do, especially if you're new and this is your first Sunday, is every week we are going to take the Word of God. We're going to open it up. We're going to read it together, and we are going to look into it and spend about the next 30 to 35 minutes trying to see if we can't figure out what it is that God is desiring to teach us through His Word. And so we're going to start today walking through the book of Habakkuk. It's a small book. It's only three chapters long. Uh, it is what we call one of the minor prophets, which is a collection of about 14 different books in the Old Testament, we call them the minor prophets, not because they were like lesser importance, but because they were shorter. And we call the major prophets all of the longer books. So books like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, we call the major prophets. I don't know why we didn't just call them the longer prophets and the shorter prophets, but somehow we just came up with major and minor. All right, so Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets. All right, he was written... Uh, to the people of Jerusalem. And it's interesting because if you've never read through the prophetic literature uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the prophetic literature, which starts at Isaiah and goes all the way to the end of the Old Testament, is really this amazing succession of messages from God to literally everyone in the known world at that time around Israel. In fact, it starts out with the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah is really written from God with messages to not only the Israelites and to Judah, but also to all of the nations that surround. Then from there, the prophets continue on, and we see that, that they're written to very targeted groups. For instance, Hosea and Amos were written to the nation of Israel. Lamentations, Micah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Zephaniah, and this book we're going to study today, Habakkuk, were written to Judah. Jonah and Nahum were written to Assyria, Obadiah to Edom, Daniel and Ezekiel were written to, he, to the Hebrew exiles when they were in Babylon, and Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi were written to the Hebrew exiles after they had come out of Babylon. And so the prophetic literature 
really gives us this ability and this opportunity to see the heart of God and the word of God given to every group of people over a pretty large swath of time in history. And I think what we find in it is that we find some hidden treasure in what God was trying to say to his people and what I think God is trying to say to us. Now, we don't know much about the prophet Habakkuk other than he is only one of three biblical writers who are explicitly identified as prophets in the Bible. That, along with the psalm-like structure of chapter 3 when we get there, has led most scholars to conclude that we think Habakkuk was a member of the Levites, that he was a servant in the temple. He was a minister, which is important because he would have had a first-hand view of what was going on in the religious life of God's people. He would have seen firsthand what was happening spiritually with the people of Judah and in Jerusalem in particular. And what was taking place when Habakkuk is writing is this, is that Assyria had fallen as an empire in 612 BC and Babylon was on the rise. Egypt had defeated the last king of Judah, King Josiah, in a battle that he should have never gone to fight. In fact, God told him that if he went out to this battle, that he was going to lose his life. And sure enough, Josiah goes out all right, to try to defeat Egypt, and he dies. And from the midst of that, Egypt begins trying to supplant or implant puppet kings into Judah, into the southern kingdom. Those kings don't last long, and more than just not lasting long, those kings leave the spiritual revival of Josiah far behind. And they lead Judah again into idolatry and debauchery and self-centered living. And so as Habakkuk looks around at the condition of his culture, as he looks around at the condition of his nation, as he looks around at the condition of God's people, he begins to struggle with the fact that things are not the way they ought to be. And as a result... The prophet is troubled by what he sees. I love this quote from Tony Evans. He says this. He says that most prophets spoke to the people what they heard from God. Habakkuk spoke to God about what he saw. It's an entirely unique frame of reference in the prophets. Ray Stedman goes and he says it this way. He says, here's a man who is disturbed about his nation. He sees everything going wrong. The people are living in wickedness, civil unrest, Rioting, violence, injustice, and oppression permeate the land. When issues of injustice are brought before the courts, the courts themselves are corrupt. He goes on and he says this. He says that the prophet Habakkuk is a prophet for our times. He lived in times very much like our own, and he struggled with one of the central questions of our age. Why does God allow bad things to happen? So let me ask you this morning, whether you're here in this room, whether you are joining us online today, do you look around at your life? Do you look at, around at the things that are happening in your family and in your job and in our city and in our nation and in our world and you think to yourself, this is not the way things ought to be? Do you look around at what's happening and you wonder where God is in the midst of all of it? If so, then this book is for you and it's for me. And my hope is that it both encourages us and challenges us. That this is a book that will bring us both hope and it's a book that's going to hurt our feelings a little bit along the way. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to read Habakkuk. I want us to start in chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 together. Here's what scripture says. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw... O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Would you pray with me? God, as we come to you and as we begin to look in your word this morning, Lord, my prayer is that you would meet us in this place and in this time. And God, whether we are here physically, whether we are here virtually, Lord, that you would speak your truth into our hearts, that you would help us to understand your word and apply it rightly to our lives. And God, that you would say anything that you desire to say to us this morning. 
Lord, I pray that you would let every part of me wash away and that every part of you and your glory might be built up in my place. You take this time and you do with it what you will. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want you to look at verses 2 and 3 because Habakkuk starts out this book with really a question and a complaint. Do you see what he says? He says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you look idly at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contentions arise. Do you notice the words that Habakkuk uses to describe the situation he sees? He says violence. He says iniquity. He says destruction and violence and strife and contention. Can you sense the frustration in these words? Habakkuk is living in a time where everyone seems to only care about themselves. He's living in a time where everyone seems to only pursue their own pleasure and their own profit and their own promotion. He's living in a time where sin is rampant. He's living in a time where there is doctrinal decline among the people of God. He's living in a time where the leaders of his nation have instituted their own false self-righteousness in place of God. He's living in a time when the culture was dominated by immorality and greed and deception and hatred and hypocrisy and anger and injustice. And what he says to God, his first words, do you notice this? Oh Lord, how long? How long must I witness the spiritual decline of my people? God, how long? He says, must he see the moral and spiritual fiber of his nation decay before God does something? This resonates with me. I don't know if it resonates with you or not, but it resonates with me. How long, oh God? But I'm also encouraged because as I studied this over the last few weeks, I have been reminded that this question, the question of how long, it resounds throughout Scripture. For instance, just in the book of Psalms alone, we see this in Psalm 10.1. Scripture says, Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 13.1 starts out and says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Psalm 22.1 starts out and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Psalm 44, 24 says, Why do you hide your face from me? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? Psalm 55, 2 says, Please listen and answer me, for I am overwhelmed by my trouble. Psalm 71, 12 says, Oh God, don't stay away. My God, please, David writes, please hurry to help me. Psalm 88, 14 says, O oh Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you turn your face from me? Psalm 89, 46 says, How long, O oh Lord, will you hide your face forever? How long will your wrath burn like a fire? Do you hear the spiritual agony in the Psalms? I'm going to ask that question again because I'm not sure that we do. We live in an age of spiritual hype. We live in an age where the best way to grow a church, the best way to get YouTube hits and shares is to share a positive message, man. It's to share something that feels good and sounds good, right? Something that you can bring in a prop with you that works really well for a Facebook share. But what I want you to hear is that throughout Scripture, a question echoes from soul to soul, from age to to age, from generation to generation, and the question is this, is how long, oh God? How long? Why? Why is this going on? Why am I having to deal with this? Why won't you act? What is going on? The spiritual anguish that we see in Scripture is absolutely unavoidable. It's unavoidable. And we see a similar anguish in Habakkuk. He was having a hard time reconciling what he knew about God with what he saw happening around him. And what it does is it leads him to this assumption in verse 4. Look at what he says. 
He says this, he says, so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. You see that word for paralyzed? It literally meant powerless or impotent. That's a striking statement to make about the law of the Lord, to say that God's word is powerless, that God's word is impotent. And here's what I think it shows us. I think it shows us that Habakkuk was in a place where he was beginning to question the very veracity or genuineness of God. God, can I really trust you? Do you really mean what you say? Is your word really true? That's the question he was asking. But he's not only questioning the genuineness of God. He's also questioning the virtue or the very goodness of God. Do you notice what he says here? He, sees, he says, justice never goes forth. Now, what I love about this is in the original language, in the Hebrew, this is actually a double negative. So how it should read for us is this. Justice never, no, never goes forth. What Habakkuk is saying is, look, I just don't see it right now. I don't think I will ever see it, is what he says. Which means that what Habakkuk is starting to question is, is God really who he says he is? Because I don't know if I can trust what he says right now. And I don't know if I can ever trust what he says again. That's a hard question, is it not? If you're watching this online today, can I ask you, have you ever been in that place that you've questioned if God really is who he says he is, if you can ever trust who he is? If you're here this morning, maybe that's you inside your own heart. You're not sure that you can believe that God is who he is, that he will do what he has said he will do. Habakkuk was witnessing a culture in which he saw no justice. And as he begins to doubt not only what God has said, but who God is, he begins to really doubt that he will ever see justice able to be done. He says, you see this? For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. In other words, I don't think I'll ever see justice. And if I ever do, I can't count on it. Because my definition of justice, it won't be the right one. My definition of justice, that's not what God's going to bring about. My definition of what should be done, God's not going to do that. Habakkuk at his core was beginning to question his very faith, not only that the word of God was impotent, but that the heart of God was indifferent to what was happening. Church family, I want us to make no mistake. Habakkuk is looking around at the world around him and he is struggling to hold on. He is struggling to believe in what God's word says and in who God is. And it's a struggle. Again, I, I want to say this. You're going to hear me say this multiple times as we study this book. This is a struggle that we see multiple pictures of in Scripture. I think about the book of Job, which the entire book of Job is a picture of what does it mean to struggle in your faith? What does it mean to walk when God has not done what you wanted him to do? In fact, when God has allowed everything bad to happen that you didn't think he would allow to happen. And I think we see the same anguish in Job. Look at Job 9, 24. Scripture writes this. It says, The whole earth is in the hands of the wicked, and God blinds the eye of judges. If he's not the one who does it, who is it? Job looks around and he says, Look, if God hasn't been the one that allowed all this to happen, if God hasn't been the one that caused all of this to happen, then who did it? That's what Job says. He goes on later in the book in Job 19, 7, and he says this. He says, Behold, I cry out violence. The same word Habakkuk cries out, but I'm not answered. He says, I call for help, but there's no justice. Later on in the book of Job, in chapter 30, he says this. He says, I cry to you for help and you do not answer me. He says, I stand and you only look at me. Can I ask you, do you feel that way a little bit? Do you feel this morning like you are standing and saying to God, why? How long? What are you going to do about this? Why have you let this happen? And all it feels like is God is blankly, silently staring back at you. That even if he does see you, you don't know if he cares about you. I wonder, I wonder 
If the questions that were burning in Habakkuk's soul, if the questions that were burning in the psalmist's soul, if the questions that were burning in Job's soul are not much different than what we deal with today. We struggle to understand the existence of suffering and evil, don't we? We ask this same question, right? We say, how? How can a loving God allow injustice and evil? Isn't this the question we're afraid to ask? Isn't this the question we don't really want to talk about too much with our friends who are wondering about Christianity or struggling with the faith? And what happens, church family, if we're not careful is even though we may show up here at church week in and week out, what happens is we begin to doubt if God's word is really true. And we begin to doubt if God really does care for us. None of us are immune. Most of us know Mother Teresa for her ministry to the poorest of the poor in the slums of Calcutta. But as with so many of us, Mother Teresa had a public side and she had a private side. And what most people may not know about Mother Teresa is that she suffered with long periods of personal depression and spiritual darkness in her life. In fact, she wrote this in one of those seasons. She says this, Darkness is such that I really do not see neither with my mind nor with my reason. The place of God in my soul is blank. There is no God in me. When the pain of longing is so great, I just long and long for God. And then it is that I feel he does not want me. He is not there. Heaven, souls. Why, these are just words which mean nothing to me. My very life seems so contradictory. I help souls to go where? Why all of this? The great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, suffered the same type of depression, the same type of darkness. In fact, he wrote this in one of his journal entries that was later published. He said, there are times when all of our evidences get clouded and all of our joys are fled. Though we may still cling to the cross, yet it is with a desperate grasp. For some of us this morning, isn't this how we feel? Can I, can I just be honest with you? This has been me in different moments over this last year and a half. So family, I'm so tired of dealing with everybody's ugliness. I'm so tired, I, I'm just going to be honest with you, of dealing with everybody's opinions, with everybody's contrast, right? Everybody's contradictions, everybody's ideas of what should happen and what should be. I'm so tired of seeing just the absolute disregard for others that's everywhere around us, that we don't care about anyone else, we just care about our own opinions, we just care about what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. I'm tired of thinking that we've made progress back to normalcy, right? Just to be sitting back in this room, masked up, distanced out, wondering where things go from here. I'm tired. And there have been moments this year where I have looked at God and said, God, where are you? How are we supposed to do this? What are, we, what are we supposed to do in the midst of this? How are we supposed to even push back against it? How are we supposed to call out what's true and what's not true? How can we even stand against sin when we're so caught up in ourselves? God, how long until you finally show up and say, this is not okay? How long until you show up and you heal us? How long until you do something? Church family, I wonder how many of us have this same question in our souls. And so I think the question for us as we begin to look at this book of Habakkuk is this. Is what do we do when God does not make sense to us? What do we do when God does not make sense to us? I think the answer can be seen in how Habakkuk responds to his doubts and to his questions. If you notice, Habakkuk doesn't go to others for the answers. If you know Job's story at all, you know that what happened is Job's friends come to him to comfort him. And it turns into Job going to them and asking, why has this happened to me? And so the, almost the entire book of Job is this dialogue back and forth between Job and his friends on what's going on. Habakkuk doesn't do that. He doesn't go to someone else for the answers he's seeking. 
He doesn't run away like Jonah does. If you know Jonah's story, when Jonah hears something from God that he doesn't want to hear, when he doesn't see God do what he doesn't want to do, Jonah runs trying to get to the very ends of the known world. But that's not what Habakkuk does. He also doesn't laugh. I think about Abraham and Sarah's story, and Sarah's name means laughter, or literally bitter laughter, right? But actually, both Abraham and Sarah laughed when the promise of a son came to them. Abraham did it first, Sarah did it second, but Habakkuk doesn't even laugh. What he does is instructive for us. What he does is that he comes to God. He doesn't run from God. He comes to God boldly, honestly, and he lays his heart before the Lord. I think we see that in verse 1. Look at what verse 1 says. It says, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Now this is again where just the English language doesn't really do us justice here because this word doesn't mean message. You know what this word means? It means a doom. It means a burden, a heavy burden. It literally means an ominous utterance. And so maybe, just maybe what we see in the fact that Habakkuk comes to the Lord not with a happy song, not with a spiritual trope, but he comes with an ominous utterance. He comes with a heavy burden. He comes literally with words of doom. Is that maybe by willing to come to God with the issues that he saw, Habakkuk began the process of rebuilding his faith. And so here's my question this morning. Is what if... Acknowledging your doubts, as Habakkuk did, is your first step towards building a deeper faith. What if embracing your secret questions, embracing the things you want to know, is what opens the door to truly experiencing who God really is? What if drawing closer to God, developing a genuine relationship with Him, requires for us to bear what feels unbearable? What if it's in the midst of real pain that we also experience real and abiding hope? Is it fair? No. But can I share something with you this morning? Whether you're with us online or here, where in Scripture were we promised fair in this universe? Was it fair That even though God gave mankind perfection in the garden, that we chose to go our own way? Was it fair that even when God brought his people out of deliverance, out of bondage in Egypt and said, look, here is how you can stay in my presence forever, just obey these laws, that we still couldn't do it? Was it fair that when God sent his own son to die for us, to pay the price that we couldn't pay, that the only way that could happen was that Jesus had to give his life on the cross for us, that God had to turn his back on his own son to save you and to save me? Was that fair? No. Can I be honest with you? I think we ask the question of fairness because we're scared to wrestle with the deeper questions that are riding inside of us. I think in our hearts, we know it's not fair. I think in our hearts, we know it's not supposed to be fair. I think in our hearts, we know that fairness is nothing but a red herring. It's not supposed to be fair. And so what if it's by coming to God and saying, God, I don't understand it. I don't like it. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's fair. I don't agree with it. What are you going to do about it? What if it's in that moment that we begin to find the answers that we are crying for? I love this book of Habakkuk. You know why? Because this book is a lament. This book is a prayer. It is a desperate cry to God. Because the truth is, sometimes the road back to God isn't smooth and easy. Sometimes it's filled with potholes and with bumps and with obstacles in the way. But church, listen to me. To hear God through an anonymous utterance, to see him and to trust him in our moment of doom, to embrace his strength when we are weak and we are heavily burdened, that is a faith that can last. 
That is a faith that will stand on its own. That is a faith that will carry you through every season of life. That is the faith we need. So what do we do when God doesn't make sense to us? Here's what I want to ask us to do this morning. I'm going to ask Ari to come up. And as she comes, I want to invite us this morning to take a few minutes. And here's what I want to invite us to do. I want to invite us to do what Habakkuk did, which is to cry out. I want to invite us to lament, to say to God, I don't understand why you allow the injustice I see. I don't understand why you allow the brokenness that's around me. I don't understand why you're allowing me to walk through the season and the struggle that I'm in right now. God, I don't understand. To come to him like this prophet came to him, whether that's at your seat, whether that's in your living room, or whether that's at this altar. What I want to invite you to do this morning is to get on your knees and to cry out to God. And say, God, I don't understand. You know, Scripture gives us amazing examples of what it means to wait on God. For Abraham and Sarah, they waited some hundred years to fully see the promise of God worked out in their lives. For Joseph, it took 13 for him to see the dreams that God had given him come true. For David, it took 17 years before he took the throne that God had anointed him for. For Moses... It was 40 years of exile in Midian before he heard the voice of God speak to him. For Job, it took 40 chapters before God finally shows up and says, now let me talk to you. For Habakkuk, what we're going to see next week is it took one verse. So I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what you're asking. I don't know how long you've been waiting. But can I promise you this? God wants to answer you. In fact, I would almost say to you that I can promise you that God will answer you. Scripture gives us example over example, but God cares and he will listen. Just real quick as Ari begins to play, I want to read to you a few verses. Jeremiah 33 says this, call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Psalm 50 says, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Psalm 91, 14 says, because you hold fast to me in love, I will deliver you. I will protect you because you know my name. He goes on and says, when you call to me, I will answer you and I will be with you in trouble. I will rescue you and honor you. And with long life, God says, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. 1 John chapter 5, the apostle says this. He says, and this is the confidence that we have towards him. That if we ask anything according to his will, anything, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, I want you to listen to this. Then we know that we have the request that we've asked for. What are you praying for? What are you crying out for? What are you waiting for God to show up and to answer this?